William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Murderers must have a lot of trouble keeping their books balanced. For one thing, they can't always be sure when they're going to make their next killing. And for another, so many of their assets are buried. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Being a confidential investigator can easily become an office job if you've got an office, which I have. And you spend all your time in it, which I don't. Clients cross you up sometimes, though. Joey Carter made a stab in that direction on this particular day. I had a meal at Willie's Wagon, if you could call it a meal. What would you call it, Mr. Craig? Tenant. Big joke. Something wrong with a hamburger? Well, it's been fatally wounded, Willie. Yeah. Next time, you might wait till it dies before serving it. My customer should live so long. Why, thank you, Willie. I can remember a time when Private Dix could hardly read. They were all making witty remarks. Sorry. Have a cup of coffee? Oh, I'm not that sorry. There's nothing wrong with a coffee. Well, there's nothing wrong with sulfuric acid either, but I'll hold on to my stomach lining for a while longer, if you don't mind. What's so special about your stomach lining? It's attached to me. Ah, you're getting sentimental. Which reminds me, there was a guy in here looking for you about an hour ago. Oh? Nervous little punk. I gave him your office address. He must have missed me. An hour ago, I was on my way here. Yeah? What was he nervous about? He didn't whisper nothing in my shell-like ears. Then how'd you know he was nervous? He couldn't keep his hand from trembling. The one that was holding the gun, I mean. Willie had nothing more to offer except the coffee I'd already turned down, so I got out. After Willie explained that my prospective client hadn't exactly been waving his gun around. He'd just been clutching it in a side pocket. Jake, who'd given up a handful of stony acres in Vermont for an elevator cage in the building where I had my office, added a few, very few, well-chosen words. Hi. Hello, Jake. Nice day. Yep. How have things been on Madison Avenue today? Dull. No pretty girls? I reckon there was. Now, don't tell me you're getting old. Busted my glasses. Oh. Well, tomorrow will be another day. Yeah. But I'd like to get up to my office before then. Oh, I keep forgetting. Going up? Where else could I go from the ground floor? I guess you're going up. Other fellow went up, too. Which other fellow? One looking for you. Well, thanks for letting me in on it. Was he a small man? Uh, yeah. Nervous? Yep. Said he'd wait for me in the office? Yeah. He ain't come down either. Which means he's still up there, unless he used the back stairs. Yeah. Did he mention why he wanted to see me? No. He was carrying a gun, wasn't he? Oh, you heard about him? From Willie. He tried to get a hold of me at the wagon, but... Uh, fella drink any of Willie's coffee? I don't know. You better hurry on to your office, because if that fella did... Yeah. You'd be needing major surgery. <laughs> You're exaggerating. Well, I had some of that coffee when I first come to town, before I knew better. You're still alive. Yeah, but mighty feeble. You just hear something, Mr. Craig? Your buzzer. Somebody's ringing for you downstairs. Uh, what's the matter with them? Can't they walk up a few stairs? They may never have used your elevator before. You want again? Noisy, fellas. Excuse me. Not at all. Jake's elevator headed downstairs at considerably less than the speed of light. I headed for my office, in no particular hurry. I don't like small men with guns. Sometimes they get to thinking they need a gun as an equalizer. It might be psychological, but bullets never heard of Sigmund Freud. I didn't spot him when I first got into the office. It was late afternoon. The dying sunlight didn't quite make it to the corners of the room. It was in a corner that my client was waiting for me. A lonely corner, 
the loneliest of all, the corner where a man creeps to die. The knife went in under the left shoulder blade and pierced the heart. He died maybe an hour ago. Death was not instantaneous. There's no identification on him. Labels on his clothes have been ripped off. Until further notice, he'll go on the books as John Doe deceased. Briefly and beautifully put, Lieutenant Rogers. Let's not be formal, Barry. <laughs> you, uh, taking Junior with you? Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll turn up something with his fingerprints. The odds are good. The gun he was carrying had its serial number filed off. Professional. Yeah. Makes it funny, though. Why? His prints are on record. Whoever killed him must have known that. Why bother with stripping the body of identification? Time, maybe. I suppose. He was trying to get in touch with you. Somebody was anxious about that. I'd imagine so. Somebody's anxiety killed John Doe. Looks that way. We'll find out who John Doe was sooner or later. Once we get that, we might be able to make a good guess about why he wanted to see you. That's possible. The boy with the knife wouldn't care for that. He might try using that knife again. Be careful, will you, Barry? It was good advice, but uh, how can you be careful when you don't know what you've got to be careful about or who? Tracing John Doe was taking time. Time in which the sun dived behind the high stone walls of the city and got lost. Time in which I got tired of sitting around in a darkened office and staring into a corner where nothing was anymore. So I got out. I buzzed the elevator quickly and settled down to wait. But the elevator started up fast. I didn't think much of it until it was close to my floor. Then I thought in a hurry. In all the years Jake had been piloting that elevator, he'd never responded that fast. I moved back, pulling at the gun in my pocket. I didn't make it by the time the elevator door opened, so I dived for the carpet. I made a mental note to speak to the management. That carpet hadn't been swept in months. The little stranger in the elevator hadn't waited to see if the bullets had found me. I thought maybe I could let him know if I got down the back stairs fast enough. Then I ran into Jake at the foot of the stairs, slumped behind the door that led to them. Jake. Uh, oh. Jake. Yeah, if oh. I remember correct. Boy, you had me worried for a minute. Hi. Hi. Head don't feel so good. You were hit on it. Maybe that's why I don't feel so good. <laughs> Must have been hit by a piece of my farm up in Vermont. A rocky piece. That was the only kind there was. Here. Oh. Uh, thanks, Mr. Craig. How is it? It was better laying down. I figure I'll live, though. Good. Getting my glasses back tomorrow. You're... Oh. You mean you'll be able to see the girls on Madison Avenue again? Yeah. Well, maybe we better get back to the lobby. Might be customers. All right, but hold it where you are. Uh. Hmm. Well, the lobby's empty. Come on. You... You figured the fellow that hit me might still be around? Possibly. Too bad he ain't. Not so bad. He was carrying a gun. Oh? Mine, it's a few bullets now. Well, I took the elevator up? When I rang for it. Oh, well, you got dust on your suit, Mr. Craig. Carpet upstairs? Yeah. Ought to be swept sometime. You might take it up with the cleaning woman. Yeah. When she gets over her lumbago. The carpet hasn't been swept for years. Well, Miss Abercrombie's had lumbago for years. Hmm. Jake, did you see the man who slugged you? Uh, not too good. My glasses. Oh, see. yeah. Well, he's probably a half a dozen miles from here by now. So long, Jake. Going out? Sure. Mr. Craig. Yeah? The fella that took them shots at you, he might be hanging around. What for? Another helping. No, it was a professional job. Hit and run. If they don't make it the first time, they wait until they can arrange another setup. Well, I hope you're right, Mr. Craig. So, uh, do I. My analysis was probably right. That didn't prevent me from holding my breath as I went through the lobby door. Then across the strip of pavement that separated me from my car and into it. I didn't waste any time getting underway. No gunfire. I decided I could start breathing again. 
Mr. Craig? I beg your pardon? Oh, I, I'm the one who should... Let's not the... quibble about who begs whose pardon. I'm just a little worried about whether this is my car. It's your car. I never noticed that it came equipped with a small blonde before. Do you mind? I was a normal red-blooded American boy, Miss... My uh... name is Doris. Doris Cheney. How do you do? And do you spend much of your time parking in other people's cars? Only when the other people are Barry Craig. Must be my new tie. The man who sold it to me said it would attract blondes like flies. It's not a very nice comparison. Flies are pests. Blondes can be, too. On the other hand... Uh... <laughs> now that the gay chit-chat is over, well... But I, I had to see you. I've got an office. Oh, I couldn't be seen going there. You're shy? I'm afraid. And you figured staking out in my car, you'd be safe. Well, for a while, anyway. And eventually, you'd come out and get in the car. And then we'd be together. Yes. Without witnesses. Yes. You're fumbling with your bag. Is there a gun in it? No, there isn't. I, I'm, I'm nervous. It's too early. We haven't come to the reasons for your being here yet. We've come to the reasons. My mistake. The name of the man who was killed in your office today was William Cheney. I concentrated on my driving. Concentrating on a small blonde is more fun, but is more likely to end up in a crash. She didn't add anything to the identification. I didn't figure she was finished yet, though. I gave her the cue. Relative? My husband. No relative. We, we haven't been living together for some time. He made noise when he ate soup? He was the thief. Oh, and that wore on your nerves. Well, I hadn't known when I married him. That happened. You don't sound as if you believed me. I don't have to believe you. You're not a client. What? Some reason or other, people never tell the truth to detectives if they can help it. Maybe they figure detectives should be smart enough to find out the truth for themselves. Sometimes detectives do. But if I were a client? I'd have to believe you. It's not on my license, but it's the way I play. I want you to believe me, Mr. Craig. It's 50 a day in expenses. That's not too bad. Depends on what you're buying. Suppose you hire me. What are you in the market for? An alibi, maybe? Alibi? For what? Your husband didn't die of old age. Oh, you think I... You could have. You knew where my office was. You knew he died there. But... Did you kill him? No. Okay. For now, we'll accept that as being true. The next thing is, what do you need a confidential investigator for? I know who killed my husband. She had a habit of throwing small bombshells as though she didn't know they were explosives. I sat that one out for a few seconds. It gave me time to wonder if the car that was trailing us intended to get any closer. It didn't. Not yet, anyway. You know who killed William Cheney? Yes. The district attorney will love you with a great love if you drop in and tell him. I can't. You don't care for the legal profession? I don't have any proof. That's a discouraging detail. But I know it has to be... Has to be who? You've been staring up into the rearview mirror all the time. Why? Car's been following us ever since we left my office. Who does it have to be? Car? Then someone... So far as we know, no one saw anything but me getting into my car and driving away. Who killed your husband? They must have noticed... It's some... night. They've not been close enough to make any identifications. Maybe not even to spot the fact that I've got a passenger. Why are you holding out on me? I I'm not only... The headlights are getting bigger. We're going to have company pretty soon. Look, Mrs. Cheney, it's corny. Somebody with something important to tell is stalling about it until it's too late. You mean until they get killed? Yeah. And by then, the something important isn't important anymore. At least not to the one who died. John Hurley. John Hurley. My husband worked for him. And since your husband's profession was a thief, you mean he stole for him? Yes. That's background. Now hand me motive. My husband stole something. Hurley thought he was going to double cost him, not turn it over to him. Was he? I don't know. I haven't seen Bill for months since we separated. You make the marriage sound like ancient history. Your news is fresh, though. Well, Bill phoned me lots of times, begged me to take him back. But... What was it he was holding out? Oh, I'm not sure. Jewels, I think. Uh-huh. Slide off the seat and get on the floor. What? Do as I say. All right. What, what's wrong? Car trailing us is getting too close. I've been shot at once today. It could happen again. I don't want you in the line of fire. But they might not miss again. I know. That's why I'm going to dedicate a fender or two to self-preservation. 
Grab onto something. We're going to have a small collision. For what happened immediately after I'd cut my car in front of the one coming up behind, you'll have to consult somebody else. Obviously, both cars spun, split across the street, and wound up attacking a lamppost. I was among those present, sure, but I wasn't sitting up and taking notice. I was lying down and being unconscious. Oh. Barry. Oh. Oh. For a little while, I thought maybe my sins had been overlooked and I was in a better place. But what would the voice of Lieutenant Rogers be doing in a better place? I guess you're alive. Thanks. Oh, ouch. I could have told you this was no time to brush your hair back. It's my older brother who has two heads. Maybe I'm my older brother. That lump you're fondling isn't another head. Oh. Fred. Yes? Yeah? News. You and another car had a collision with each other and the lamppost. That I remember, partially anyway. Except the collision was intentional. Oh? I'll explain later. You keep going. Well, a crowd collected immediately, but despite that, or uh, maybe because of that... Whoever was in the other car disappeared. Too bad. However, that crowd probably saved my skin. The car was trailing mine, Trav. Outran me. I figured it would probably outgun me, too, so I had an accident. For a man with a thick skull, that was probably the brightest thing to do. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, I don't feel very much like making sudden movements with my head. That's why I haven't looked around, but... Uh, Trav, does there happen to be a small blonde on the premises? I've looked around. Not even a big blonde. Uh-huh. Means the crowd gave her an opportunity to duck out, too. Trab. Yes? Hasn't the police department got a couple of other lieutenants they occasionally use? I was phoning your place when you left. I got Jake. Oh. And the news from Vermont was? You'd left. With another car on your trail. So you sent out an alarm? Yep. Thanks. Uh, what were you phoning me about? The identity of the corpse in your office. William Cheney? Yes, I... Hey, wait a minute. How did you know who he was? The small blonde. She must have been a very knowledgeable small blonde. Maybe. She'd also been married to William Cheney. Hmm. And uh, wanted you to do what? Find his killer. Trevor, what's the department got on Cheney? Thief of sundry and movable items, notably jewels. Big job recently? Suspected the Horsham deal. Well. Not much so far as quantity goes. One medium-sized necklace. Only it happens to be worth around uh, $100,000. Give me quality over quantity any time. Which is what Cheney and his boss must have figured. Which is also what Cheney figured. Now you've lost me. Cheney was holding out on the necklace, I'll bet. I was on my way to Cheney's house when you interrupted. Would you like to come along? Very much. If I can arrange to have my head brought with me. But I was pleasantly surprised. My head stayed with me. We got to Cheney's place. Cheney, understandably enough, wasn't home. Neither was the necklace. We made sure of that. Well, wherever he hid it, it wasn't here. No. Funny thing. You can see his wife left him... Not a dress in the place or a pair of women's shoes, but uh, he's kept her furniture around. Yeah. He wanted her to come back. I guess he didn't disturb anything. No. Her cosmetics all over the place. Perfume stuff. Yeah. Nice perfume. Hey. What? Newspaper. So I see. What was the idea of fishing it out from under all the used face tissues? Front page article was folded to. Hello. Ah. Paper's three days old. Horsham story broke three days ago. Which means Cheney was on the run for three days before they got to him in my office. Maybe he had the necklace on him? Then they'd have lost interest in me. But they didn't. No. Then the necklace is still among the missing. So far as Horsham, who owns it, is concerned, and so far as, uh, who else? So far as John Hurley is concerned, I think. The small blonde gave you Hurley's name? Yeah. It might be a lead. Why not try it? John Hurley's been a bad boy for some time now. 
The department's got lots of warrants out for him. Trouble's been, nobody's found him to sell them on him. He must be around. Oh, I'm sure he is. Not half as sure as I am. I'm the one he's been spraying bullets at. We can always issue another warrant. I don't doubt it. The only thing is, I, I'd like to be around when it happens. Around and alive. That, for the time being, was that. Trav returned to wherever lieutenants of police return in the middle of the night, and I got some work done. Not finding Hurley. No private detective can come even close to the police when it comes to tracing people. The thing is, I didn't waste time looking for Hurley. I concentrated on a small blonde. According to what your fleet dispatcher tells me, you you guys work the cab stand here at night. That's right, bud. Three of you. The one I want is the one that knows a guy named Cheney. The address is 2906. Lodge, Bart. Apartment 3B. You're the man I want. You generally take his call? Yep. You other guys, uh... Yeah. Five bucks a piece make you happy? Uh, sure, okay. Okay. Now, this Cheney was married, wasn't he? You digging up stuff for a divorce case? No, no, no. Matter of fact, you won't be called upon to testify to anything. You know what his wife looks like? Yeah. Blonde. Small. Fine. Now, maybe uh, she did this during the daytime. If she did, I'm sunk. But I've got a feeling the nighttime is the time a gal generally moves out. Some time ago, she left Lodgman. With suitcases, but no husband. You're not guessing. Not anymore. She used your cab? Yeah. Where'd you take her? The other guys rated five apiece. You rate 25. Thanks. 39-12-E-67. Thanks. Maybe I just wanted to see a small blonde again. It's one of the pleasanter things that happens to a private detective. But that wasn't the way I saw it, which could be why I didn't feel pleasant when I got to Doris Cheney's place. Who? Who is it? Barry Craig. I can't... Mrs. Cheney. Oh, all right. Come in. Thanks. Hello, Craig. Hello. You'd be Hurley, wouldn't you? Not only would be, Craig, and... Speak softly and carry a big gun? You've got a gift, Craig. Gift of expression. I couldn't have thought of that in a year. Maybe you never tried. Now I've seen the gun, you can put it away. You're too broad across the shoulders, Craig. You wouldn't have much trouble handling me. If I didn't wave the gun around, so to speak. I don't anticipate much trouble anyway. Yeah, me. Don't tell me you're one of those unbelievable characters who isn't afraid of a gun. Of course I'm afraid of a gun. Well, then? I can't see any reason for you to use it on me, that's all. Let's hope so, however skeptical we are. Hope I didn't damage your car too badly. Doesn't matter. It wasn't mine to start with. Doris. You you were unconscious, Barry. I saw Hurley get out of his car. I, I ran. I had to. Sure. How long's Hurley been here? Well, just a couple of minutes. In that case, he hasn't found the necklace yet, has he? <laughs> Craig, now I'm really surprised. Fancy you're admitting that. Or was it a slip of the tongue? Pretty obvious, isn't it? Maybe. But it takes a rare man to recognize the obvious. Now, congratulations, Craig. Now, if you don't mind, Doris, my dear. I don't have the necklace. Now, you see, Craig? She won't admit the obvious. Maybe she's frightened. Hurley, if she turns the necklace over to you, what then? You mean, will I be nasty? Kill people? Why should I? Police are after me anyway. All right. The necklace is in her bag. Barry! Bag? Ah, oh, here it is. She kept plucking at it when she came to consult me. I thought there might be a gun in it, but... Uh... Not a gun at all. A necklace? Yeah. Well, Craig, you were quite right. There's no need for me to bother you at all. I... Oh. Please. Please drop your gun, Mr. Hurley. I'm terribly nervous. I might... I dropped it. Comes of having eyes for only the mercenary. When I should have kept them on you. Please, Barry, call the police. Yeah. No question about Hurley's being the man who trailed us in that car. Man responsible for the jewel robbery. The phone? Oh, yeah. Uh, not to mention murdering my husband. Let's not mention it. What? Because he didn't. Oh. Sorry. Telephone wires do get tangled around people's arms, don't they? I'll take the gun. Neatly done. Sorry, I can't stay to admire. You're staying. We're all staying till the police come. 
And then a thief will go to jail and a murderess no. to our punishment. Some of it I've got, Barry. Fine, Trev. Whoever killed Cheney took the necklace. But Hurley was still after it, so... He didn't kill Cheney. More than that, Trev, if Hurley had the necklace, why would he have bothered keeping after me? Well, uh, but uh, Doris did. Doris had to. She had to find out if Cheney had told me about her part in the deal. Hurley wouldn't have cared. Well, that's true enough. So Hurley hung around, socking Jake on the head. And it was Doris in the elevator, wasn't it? Yeah, she missed. Jake was knocked out. All she did was walk out the front door and wait in my car. Fits together nicely. I'd uh, like something a little more dramatic, though. Oh, I can supply that, too. Doris told me she'd left her husband months ago. Hadn't had any contact with him except over the phone. Well, he could have told her about the robbery over the phone. So that didn't prove anything. But when we were in Cheney's apartment, we found a newspaper under used facial tissue. Used by a woman, naturally. Hey, hey, that's right. And the paper was uh, three days old. Three days old. Which meant Doris hadn't split up with Cheney till after the robbery. Which meant she lied. Which means a three days old newspaper is going to hang her. You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Lonely Corner, was written by Lou Vittis. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Killing Pace, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, three wise men brain each other, and a lady doll goes to the dogs when a champion greyhound makes a record-breaking sprint into the hereafter. Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has brought you William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Featured in the role of Jake was Parker Fennelly. This is Don Pardo speaking. Twain used to say, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. We might add, everybody talks about the bad conditions in our schools, but nobody does anything about it. But no, that wouldn't be quite fair. Today, good citizens all over the country are working to improve our schools. It's true that in many communities, schools are outmoded, run down, and overcrowded. But in most of those communities, intelligent, responsible citizens are joining together to improve conditions. If you'd like to do your part, join and work with local civic organizations that are trying to make educational conditions better. If you'd like to know what other communities are doing to improve their schools, just write to the National Citizens Commission for the Public Schools, 2 West 45th Street, New York, 36, New York. That's the National Citizens Commission for the Public Schools, 2 West 45th Street, New York, 36, New York. Remember, better schools build a stronger America. Now enjoy Dragnet, starring Jack Webb on the NBC Radio Network.